Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, it's already week four, these weeks are flying by. I hope you're having a great week so far. Today what I wanna do is take a little bit of time and talk to you guys about prisons. This is gonna be our first week in what will be a series of different weeks focusing on life inside of prison based on individual characteristics. But today what I wanna do is spend a little bit of time focusing on the facility itself. And what I wanna do is really start looking at prisons from an institutional level um, because these are places where people are going to be spending significant amounts of time, even if it's just a couple years, it's a significant amount of time. But potentially these inmates are living in these prisons for the rest of their lives. Sometimes they're even dying while they're still incarcerated. Um, and that's that's a huge thing for an individual to go through. Um, so I wanna spend a little time focusing on the facilities themselves. So depending on what they actually did, the crime in question, we know that first you have to commit a felony in order to go to an actual prison. Um, but when I'm talking about the type of crime that they committed, was it violent, nonviolent, all of that sort of thing. So depending on the crime that was committed, their individual prior record, the severity and dangerous of the dangerousness of the current offense, um, their behavior while they're incarcerated, so whether it's their current stay, prior stays, um, all of that stuff, inmates are assigned a security risk level based on all of that information, and then they are transferred to the specific prison in question that will house inmates of their specific security risk level. Um, so it might be a specific prison, it might even be a specific wing within a prison, depending on the geographic location in which you are being incarcerated. Not all states have enough prisons to have their own prison that's of a risk level, but they might have a wing within their prison um, to be able to house specific um, security levels <laughs> within that wing. So at the state level, most commonly inmates are being supervised in either minimum, maximum, or I'm sorry, minimum, medium, or maximum. Sometimes there's a super max there, um, but some states just use their maximum as their super maximum um, security level unit or their facilities. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still coughing after all this time. Okay, um, but federal facilities are a little bit different. They have a broader spectrum of security risk levels, um, and there are actually five different levels at the federal level compared to just the three at the state level. So the first in the series of five at the federal level um, it's known as minimum security, and these are the actual federal prison camps. They're very, very low level. Inmates are allowed to walk around. Um, these are often nonviolent first-time federal offenders. This is a dormitory style of housing. Um, these camps almost don't really recognize what we associate to be a traditional prison. So there's no barbed wire around the perimeter of the prison, there is minimal to no fencing at all. Um, security measures are very lessened. There's less staff. Um, inmates are not prone to violence. They have not committed a violent offense to even get in the prison to begin with. Um, this style of facility, jokingly, in, when a white collar offender commits a crime, they go to camp. This is the joke. This is what they mean um, by the facility that they're going to be incarcerated in. But these are normally not inmates that are prone to violence. They're not prone to escape. Um, and they have to qualify based on the type of offense that they commit and their behavior while they are incarcerated. Next up, we have what is considered low security. And these are the beginnings of what are actually prisons. Um, however, we're still seeing the more dormitory style of housing rather than the cell blocks. And there might be a some level of uh, history of violence with some of the inmates, but not all. And these are still facilities that are lacking the traditional razor wiring around them to keep the inmates in. We do see a stronger level of fencing. There is a little bit more staff, um, but these inmates normally are serving smaller sentences. So you have to have um, less than 20 years remaining on your sentence in order to even be eligible to stay. 
Um, but again, this is based on individual risk assessment to see if you qualify for that type of prison. So then we're getting into what is considered a little bit more high risk um, or what we consider to be an actual correctional institution. And that's with our third category known as medium security. And this is going to be the first institution, the first correctional facility um, at the federal level. They're not actually called prisons. They're called federal correctional institutes. But this is the first facility that represents or resembles what is it considered to be a true prison. So these are the ones where we have cell blocks. We have one to two individuals in each cell. Um, a number of these inmates are known to have a history of violence. So these are the people who are a little bit more at risk. And here we have the um, the facilities have the stronger, higher levels of fencing, and it has the razor wire all along them. Um, there's going to be watchtowers and armed perimeter vehicles that are, are, are driving around multiple times a day to keep an eye on the facility. You're going to have more correctional officers in the actual facility itself. As it has cell blocks, you're going to have multiple checkpoints. You're going to have multiple um, areas in which they can shut and isolate off specific quadrants of the facility itself. And these are the inmates who, um, again, based on individual risk assessment, are going to qualify to stay here, but you have to have less than 30 years remaining in order to qualify for a medium security facility. Um, the medium security facilities are the most common that we will see. So you will, it has the most number of inmates, the, the largest number of the actual facilities. It's the most common type within the Federal Correctional Institute itself. Um, then our fourth level, we have what are considered the high level facilities, and these are actually called federal penitentiaries. If you remember um, back in, I think maybe the first week, we talked about the idea of a penitentiary. Um, and here we have places like um, Leavenworth, Atlanta is a federal penitentiary. When it was still open, Alcatraz was a federal penitentiary. Um, McNeil Island was a federal penitentiary. These higher level security facilities um, that are housing the most violent of the federal inmates. This is where we're going to see solitary isolation pop up. Again, we're seeing inmates that are housed in cells. Um, they're having the most significant histories of violence both on the streets and within the prisons. Um, there's a lot of gang-related activity in federal penitentiaries, um, a lot of group-based violence. Here's where we see multiple instances of fences and, and the armed guards in the watchtower. Um, but because these facilities, <coughs> excuse me, are known to have such high levels of violence, very infrequently will you have sex offenders housed here, largely because the sex offenders are hated among other inmates and they will be targets of violence themselves. And if you have any confidential informants um, that are incarcerated, they won't be here. And if you have an inmate that tries to be a confidential informant while incarcerated, meaning they're turning state's evidence while they're incarcerated, they will very quickly re be removed from the situation so that the other inmates won't kill them. Okay. Um, and then finally, that's yeah, that's four. Okay, so we got one more. One, The fifth one, one is more of a catch-all security level, and it's known as administrative security, and that's sort of everything else that's not in the first four categories. So if you have a federal medical hospital for inmates, that's considered administrative security. Um, the institutions that house um, the mentally ill offenders would be considered part of the administrative security. Um, federal detention facilities where you have pretrial detainees, that's considered an administrative security facility. Um, transitional centers and any metropolitan style jails that house federal inmates um, are going to be considered these more administrative security um, buildings rather than the traditional style of penitentiary or federal 
Correctional Institute. So those are your five different levels at the federal level, and they, they closely mirror what's happening at the state level as well, um, where you get the higher up you get, the more serious of a risk factor you become, um, the more prone to violence you become, the worse or more severe of an offense you committed to get yourself there to begin with, um, and normally just generally your problem children. So when we're talking about these higher risk facilities, whether it's the maximum super mass, max or the high security facility at the federal level, um, certainly depending on what you've done, you can get yourself placed there immediately. Um, but also inmates typically start out at the lower levels um, security wise and then maybe they kill somebody while they're incarcerated or they shank somebody but they don't die. They do something severe enough while they're incarcerated to be able to get themselves moved up. And the reason that they're moved up is because solitary isolation or solitary confinement is most often used in supermax and high security facilities. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But if you're there not for solitary isolation, um, or solitary confinement, most oftentimes you're in your own prison cell by yourself anyway. So it's a type of solitary confinement or isolation, um, but you have your normal privileges and luxuries still intact. You're just you just don't have a cellmate. So it's a little bit different than solitary confinement in that way. But solitary isolation or confinement, and as we know it, as more of a punishment mechanism, um, goes by a couple different names. So you might have heard it be called the SHU, or which SHU, which stands for um, Special Housing Units. It might be administrative segregation. Um, inmates are being sent to the hole, or MCU, that is management control units, um, or special needs unit, something of that nature. Um, it goes by a couple different names, but it's all basically the same beast. It's a permanent style of lockdown in which you have been deprived of most everything else and you're in this facility or you're in the special cell by yourself for punishment purposes. So when we're talking about solitary isolation in the punishment sense, normally what we're talking about is an, in, is an inmate who is by themselves for 20 two to 24 hours a day. Um, sometimes they'll be released for an hour of yard or an hour of solitary recreation by themselves. Um, a lot of prisons have dog runs or what they almost look like are dog kennels for inmates that a grown man can stand in. Um, but it sort of resembles that dog kennel style in which that's their area for recreation so that they're still confined, that they're still um sort of segregated out for security purposes, but they have time outside of their prison cell. But they're in there for 22 to 24 hours a day, most days. So you're always in your prison cell, um, minus shower time and stuff like that. But that's that's not an everyday occurrence. Um, while you're in solitary confinement, you have very limited interaction with other human beings. Um, somebody will bring you your food, and that's about the extent of the human inter interaction that you'll have most days, unless you are trying to hurt yourself or doing something like that where they need to come re remove you. Your human interaction depends on your one hour of yard, shower, and food time that you have a day. So in that limited interaction with human other human beings, your phone privileges are, are revoked, if not totally um, decreased or, or totally revoked. Family visits, <coughs> contact or non-contact are severely decreased or eliminated. Your access to rehabilitative or edu educational programs is limited or it might be completely restricted during the time that you're in solitary confinement. Um, this also includes the library, so you can't go get any books. You're not allowed to have those sort of perks and privileges while you're in solitary confinement. Um, what else? Mental health access decreases, and we're, gonna, we're about to really get into depth about mental health in just a second, but treatment decreases. There's severe restrictions on personal property, um, Correctional officers are able to, I guess, um, implement what many call no-touch torture, and that means they won't go beat you or anything like that, um, but maybe they leave the lights on in your cell all night long. They deprive your, some of your senses. 
Um, you might have extreme, extreme temperatures where they turn the air down super low or they increase the heat and try and sweat you out. There might be forced insomnia, things like that. Um, if they have to extract you, they might use chemical agents or weapons. Um, there might be stun grenades or stun guts, guts, excuse me, stun guns, a little hard to say, um, for cell extraction, but they go to extreme measures because you are considered under punishment and high risk for being there. So when we're talking about solitary confinement, what are we really talking about in terms of numbers? At the time of this recording, there was about, at a minimum, roughly 20,000 in some type of solitary confinement in prisons throughout the U.S., but that doesn't take everything into account, like those who are in juvenile detention facilities, those who are in detention facilities for ICE. Um, it doesn't take into account numbers that come from jails. We're just talking about 20,000 or so in prisons itself, and that's at the state and federal level for all prisons. And the amount of time that inmates are allowed to be in solitary isolation um, can occur from days to weeks to months. There are limitations, but oftentimes the legal limitations that occur get forgotten about or get disregarded by correctional officers and staff. And oftentimes inmates will stay in for a lot longer than they are allowed to stay in for. Um, or they might go in, come out, and then they'll get violated for something else and they'll go back in and they'll keep doing this switch back and forth so that they're not breaking any rules. The prison's not breaking any rules, but that you eventually spend so much time in solitary isolation or confinement that it starts adding up to years. Um, anecdotally, it's been said that some inmates spend more than 25 years in solitary confinement. If you add up the total amount of time, that they've been back and forth between general population and solitary confinement cells. And if you're spending 25 years, I mean, not everybody is, but even if you're spending a short amount of time in solitary confinement, um, we know that solitary confinement is sort of this breeding ground for mental health issues. And Many, many people say that solitary confinement should never be used on juvenile offenders, myself included, um, while they're still minors. Solitary confinement wreaks havoc on our minds, and for juvenile offenders, they're not yet done developing. Our brains as individuals, our brains do not stop developing until we are 25 years old or so. So to stick a minor in solitary isolation or confinement when their brains are not fully developed is inhumane, morally wrong, and very detrimental to their continued growth in their me in aspects of mental health. Um, however, across the whole world in countries that use solitary isolation or confinement, about one third of all people who are currently in solitary confinement are juveniles. I'm not just talking about the United States here. I'm talking about across the entire globe. About a third of all people are juveniles who are currently in solitary confinement. Um, and that's just not good for people who are developing still mentally, physically, socially, all these different things. Um, but even for adults, it's not a very positive experience. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, if, if you listen to individual recolle recollections about their experiences within solitary confinement, um, you know, complete with very minimal human contact, uh, a crazy amount of silence or a crazy amount of noise, all these different sensory things that are happening. It's, if the only thing you have are your thoughts to keep you company, you could imagine that for some people, they start experiencing mental health effects within even the first 24 hours of being in solitary confinement and isolation. Um, but the more prolonged exposure you have to this type of environment, of course, you're going to exacerbate any pre-existing mental health conditions, or you might even be creating things that weren't there to begin with. Um, but mental illness 
in these conditions can take a variety of different forms, um, but most commonly you start um, hallucinating both visually and auditorily. Um, there's hypersensitivity to noise and to touch when you are so isolated amongst yourself. Um, insomnia and paranoia can obviously creep up. There might be feelings of rage, fear that are induced by this environment. Um, distortions in terms of time. You don't know what day it is. You don't know if it's day or night, especially if they keep the lights on 24 hours a day. Um, so your perceptions about reality and time might start getting distorted. If all of this stuff is happening to you, there might be a severe increase in risk in terms of suicide. And then obviously when you're getting out after experiencing all of this, the possibility of post-traumatic stress disorder is also a concern and worry for us as well. Um, it's just not a good environment at all for positive mental health effects. And the American Civil Liberties Union, or the ACLU, has declared that the continued use of solitary confinement and isolation is a violation of basic human rights and has been working for years to abolish the practice here in the United States. So far, have not been successful um, overall, but... We're, we're learning more about this practice than we ever have been before. And their argument is that it's really based on the mental health effects um, that, the prison, that the practice has had on inmates who are coming out and are talking about their treatment and are having to focus on, um, you know, reestablishing good mental health practices and are seeking treatment to sort of counteract what occurred with them while they were in solitary confinement. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the specific instance or uh, specific aspects of the ACLU's stance against the use of um, <coughs> solitary confinement and isolation, I encourage you to go on their website. Um, they have documents and all kinds of different information that talk about how they feel about it, their legal stance toward it, and efforts that they're taking to get the polish um, or to get the practice abolished. I'm sorry. Um, but if you really think about it, from what we know about what happens during the use of solitary isolation and confinement, the use of the practice is really outdated and antiquated. Um, we talked earlier in the semester about the idea of Eastern State Penitentiary and the idea of solitary cells that were used to be able to afford inmates the time and opportunity to be penitent about their sins and their crimes. But the other thing that we learned about the use of solitary cells is that the inmates were starting to ex um, display mental health effects very, very quickly. So future prisons started putting inmates in with other um, with other cellmates in order to have some level of social interaction. And that's one of the things that we still use today. The idea of solitary confinement in the long term, we've known for decades, ha is not a good thing to be doing, but here we are and we're still doing it. And once again, if the correctional system is meant to correct behaviors and prepare inmates for life on the outside, how is solitary confinement <coughs> aiding us at all in that effort? It's really not. And the practice has already started to be phased out in some states um, or at a minimum is being used in very specific, dire instances, but only for the shortest of terms. Others are, other states are already looking into alternative forms of punishment, excuse me, instead of solitary confinement. And I, I would really say while it's sort of unlikely that we're going to eliminate it in the near future altogether, it is encouraging that some states are already taking a look at their practices and asking themselves whether or not this is really the best practice or whether or not there's something else that we can do a little bit differently or a little bit better. Um, so as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, we have about 20,000 people at a minimum at the state and federal level in prisons who are experiencing solitary confinement and isolation. Um, but to date, there's over 2 million people in the entire um, prison and jail system throughout the country. So we're only really talking about 1% here that are going to the extremes of being um, 
or that are going through solitary isolation and confinement, but still, in my opinion, that's about 20,000 too many, given what we know about the harms of the practice. So, <coughs> excuse me, I would say perhaps maybe one day, maybe not in my lifetime, unless something really drastic happens, um, but maybe one day we'll get to the point where solitary isolation really be does become an antiquated practice and we don't use it anymore. And maybe even we can get to the point where our correctional system gets back to the original goals that are meant to rehabilitate and actually correct behaviors rather than to make them worse or to create problems in inmates that weren't necessarily there to begin with. Um, so next week, what I want to do, let's turn our attention away from the 20,000 and let's let's turn our attention back to the 2 million. And I want to focus a little bit more on some of the more broad general issues that many inmates face while they're living in prison. So next week what we're going to do is we're going to take a general look at what life in prison is like and then we're going to start on one of the of the different um demographic characteristics of inmates and we're specifically going to focus what life is like in prison based on race so um, that probably is going to incorporate some information regarding gangs um, minority majority interactions and relationships between different inmate groups and we're going to focus on many of the racial divides that even exist between inmates and correctional officers so next week should be more of a general type of lecture excuse this dog tail um, and I hope to see you guys then. I hope you enjoyed this week. I know it wasn't necessarily the most encouraging, uplifting information, but I feel like we need to cover some of the harder topics to really delve deep down into what's going on in this country. Um, so anyway, next week we'll get back into the more general stuff, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Thank you for your time and your attention today, and I will see you guys next week for... What is it, week five already? Wow, we're really getting through pretty fast, huh? All right, I'll see you guys then. Thanks again. See you later. Bye.